Did you know that God loves a great party? Are you aware of that? I, I don't know what your perception of, of who God is and what he's really into, but God is really into a good party. I was actually at an amazing party um, uh, yesterday and into the early evening. So much so I can't tell you all about it uh, because we don't have enough time, but I just want to tell you that when we pulled up to this party, we could tell it was the better party because it was at this person's house, it was at a couple's house, but they actually had a food truck at their house. You know that that is an amazing start to a party. I was with my son, so I don't know if this is a boy thing or just an everybody thing, but we got out of there, and we, like, I was giddy, seriously, I was almost, almost giddy. It's like, oh, the food truck's here, and we get to go, and I went, to, I went twice to the food truck. I don't know if I was allowed to or not, and Kim and Libby, I think they're at home with new babies, so thank you, and if I was not supposed to go twice, I'm sorry, but it was so good. There was like sriracha coming out of this food truck, and, and just like um, uh, chicken and waffles, and all these things that, you know, you don't normally think about getting, and then you show up to a party, and you're like, oh, it was like a little bit overwhelming. This is an amazing party, and the fellowship was awesome. God is so in to a good party, and how do I know this? It's not just like what I think about the Lord. I just read the Old Testament. I'm not just a New Testament guy. I love the Old Testament as well. It's actually all one story. And in the Old Testament, God is known as like the party thrower of the nations. His people, the Israelites, were always having a party. They were always having this other feast or festival. And it was like the festival that we celebrate this and then we celebrate that. And he like mandated that his people party. And then Jesus comes in. And, and basically, his ministry is saying the kingdom of God is here. He's kind of like, hey, you know the parties that you had that looked forward to, to like what God was going to do? I, I'm here. I am the better party. And Jesus continued to invite people to himself to experience that better party. We're using that term a lot here at the Avenue Church because um, we believe that if we want to sort of reimagine evangelism, what it means to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, we, we think it's best shared at the better party. And, and so as, as you hear sort of the theme of party and better party, things like that, um, what, what, you'll, what you'll kind of begin to hopefully wrap your mind around is that we're saying that because Jesus is the better party, he's better than what everyone else has going on, it's our opportunity and privilege to simply invite people into that better party. But as you know, if you've ever been to a party or thrown a party, the better party actually requires the better host. Anybody ever host a party? Host a party? Okay. Anybody uh, like hosting a party? All right, so in my house, hosting a party means that my wife is going to get to use her gift of hospitality and that we're going we're, we're gonna to do our best not to get in arguments. That's, that's kind of what that means. If we're, ha if we're having you over, we're going to do our very best to work together, including the little children that live with us, so that nobody gets hurt and we don't get in any major like arguments because it usually means like there's some tension about throwing this better party because you know that like there, there requires a lot of thought, floor planning, cleaning, cleaning things you didn't think you needed to clean, all these sort of things, like getting on the same page of what the party's going to be about, all these expectations and sacrifice, they all kind of have to come together for it to really be the better party. Because even if we had a food truck and invite you over my house, if we weren't awesome hosts, it would be, it would be like super awkward and weird, weird right? You'd be like, what's wrong with these people? The sriracha is amazing, but they're weird. I don't want to come back. The host matters. The host matters. And today we're going to look at what does it mean to be the better host as it pertains to inviting people to Jesus, you know, because God uses hosts to, to bring people from where they are, their current reality, to this better party. I would imagine he used a host in your life to bring you to where you are today spiritually. There was somebody that God placed in front of you that walked alongside of you. And then he calls us now to do the same. So uh, in, in Luke uh, 14, uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to turn there because we're actually in, in another place in Luke. I'm just going to paraphrase. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're, we're going to be in Luke 19 if you want to turn there. But uh, in Luke 14, uh, Jesus gives us some instructions for throwing the better party. And it, it, there's a parable involved and things like that. But basically, uh, what he says at the end of the parable is he's like, just go everywhere. Go to the ends of the world. Go to the places that people might not want to go and invite them. I, ju I just want people at the party. I just want people to experience me. Go get them. 
And, and if we were to, to make a brief application of what, what you see in Luke 14, it kind of would read like this. Invite those far from the party and make it a place they would want to be. You see, it's one thing to invite somebody who's not at the party. It's one thing to go and, and, and say, hey, why don't, you come to, why don't you come to church? Or why don't you come over to my house? Or why don't you, why don't you come into kind of what, what I've got going on over here with Jesus and check it out? So it's one thing to make the invite. It's another thing, listen, it's another thing to make your church and your life and your community a place where people who don't know Jesus would actually want to be. So throw in the better party, man. You gotta have the better host. You gotta be thinking, man, is this a place where somebody who does yet not know the grace of God through Jesus Christ, is it a place where they would feel welcome, where they could feel like they belong before they actually believed? Is it a place where they would want to be? Or have I over-Christianized this thing to where they will immediately feel ostracized and super weird and want to run back to their older party because you've really not set a table for them? We don't want to be that church and we don't want to be that people because really what we're saying here is that as God uses us as the better host, as God uses this church as the better host, because Jesus lives within us, for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Christ, and because Jesus lives at the center of this church, when you invite people into your life and when you invite people into this church, you're inviting them to begin to taste that better party. So your life and this church better be a place that makes sense to those who are not yet here. Well, what would that look like? Okay, so, so Luke 14 just gives us instructions that that's what we have to do. But then when we read a little bit further in Luke 19, it kind of tells us what it would look like, okay? And so if you have your Bibles, that's, that's where we're going to be. And, and but, but before we get there, I just want to tell you, as we prepare to learn today about this becoming the better host, it's going to be under the banner of a different type of culture. A culture of friendship. A culture of friendship. Uh, many of you know that uh, probably we can invite you to a lot of cool stuff here at the Avenue Church. Hey, we've got this going on. we got this going on. We want you all to come. And some of you might actually come to those events. But it's a completely different invite if, if I'm the host and we have a relationship. If we actually have a relationship and I go to you and individually invite you through a relationship rather than just a big general announcement, you're a lot more likely to attend that particular event. So if we really want to think about ourselves as the better host inviting people to Jesus, we need to start thinking about ourselves as what would it mean to be the better friend to those who don't yet know Jesus? Culture of friendship. What would that look like? Well, uh, we have a definition of reimagining evangelism, and it reads like this. Um, so I don't know what your current definition of evangelism is. Maybe it's somebody knocking on a door. Maybe it's a big crusade. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and, and I'm not, we're not saying bad or good. We're just saying, what if we took a second and reimagined it? And, and at the center was always a crucified Christ on your personal behalf, resurrected for your sin and offering you forgiveness and new hope. So the message of the gospel never changes. But is it, is it fair? Can we, can we think about, can the, can the messaging, can the way that we explore the context of how we get this message out, can that be adaptable to our, to our, to our world today? And I think the, the answer to that is absolutely. And so we're just, we've been taking a couple of weeks and we're saying, maybe, maybe I'm stuck in a, in a thought pattern that says this is what evangelism is. But really, if I study God's word and I study Jesus, Maybe I'm seeing that evangelism is something I never actually explored before. And I can do it. I can actually do it. I don't have to just invite people and let them hear a message where the gospel is shared. I, I can be the host. So if we were to reimagine it, it might be something like this. Becoming relationally relevant. So like you have to matter to people who don't know Jesus. That's, if, if you're over here and you have really good theology, but you have no meaningful place in the life of those who don't know Jesus, we're not there yet. You need to keep reimagining. Okay, so, so it's cool that you know the gospel. That was last week, making the better invite. But you need to know the people you're making the invite to. Becoming relationally relevant in the loving, always central loving demonstration, so it's in your life, and declaration of the gospel. Okay, so last week we talked more about declaration. Um, this week we're going to talk a little bit more about demonstration. What do, what do the relationships look like that actually might begin to interest people in this better party? I want to read something to you 
from another source, and if uh, at the end of it you know where it comes from, it'd be cool if you just, uh, I'll ask you, and you can yell it out. Listen to this, page 89. <clears throat> Life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others. Yeah, you were on it. Somebody was on it already. To watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. All right, if you know where it is, go ahead and shout that out. Where does that come from? Page 89, chapter 7, under Working with Others. Comes from what's commonly known as the big book. The big book. Well, and, and that's, you're right. You're right, that's, that's actually exactly where it comes from, but you're not fully right. You're not fully right. You're right because that's where I just read it from, but, but the fullness of that answer is that that sentiment comes from the heart of Jesus. If you know anything about the big book and the influences of the big book and the Oxford group and who they were influenced by, you'll understand the connection between the heart of Jesus and like the heart of why this works. It's the bright spot in their lives. If you are a member of the program, if you're a part of the program, and you're a, you work the program, you work the steps, and you offer it to new people, one of the things that you know is the bright spot of your life is to engage with the newcomer, to engage with the one that you can pass it on to. It says here in the big book that it is like the bright spot in our lives, quote, I think that comes right from the heart, straight from the heart of Jesus. I think Jesus would say the same thing, that the bright spot in his ministry and in our lives today is when the sick meet the physician, is when the one who had wandered away meets the shepherd, when the one who is at the lesser, self-absorbed, self-draining party comes and experiences grace. That's like the bright spot. I believe that comes right from the heart of Jesus. And, you know, we can, we can talk back and forth about whether you agree with that or not. I'm just going to read you some text that I think really uh, point that out. And, and we're going to make some uh, observation and application from that as it pertains to relationships with what we might call the newcomer here even at the Avenue Church. In Luke chapter 19, um, we're going to see this concept of Jesus, friend of sinner. Luke 19, beginning in verse 1. He, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Uh, that may be familiar to some of you. If you grew up in Sunday school, you probably have a song running through your mind right now that has the word we in it. Um, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he? Listen, Zacchaeus is, I'm going to tell you, I don't know who your biblical hero is, but, but this, um, like if, you, if you're part of like the, the scrawny males, Zacchaeus is your guy. Because he was small, he had to climb up in a tree, he wasn't super powerful, he was, we don't know a lot about him, we just know that he was, he was like a wee little man. And so wee little men, this is, this is our guy, okay? And, and it's kind of interesting. I don't know why they put that in the scriptures. I'm sure there's awesome biblical reason why they included Zacchaeus' scrawniness and his littleness. And I'm saying he's scrawny. He could have been super wide. I don't know. It just, he was a little guy. And so I'm just, I'm connecting to him. And here's what it says. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Okay, so I'm out on those two. I am, I'm done there. But basically what you need to know is he wasn't liked by most Jewish people. He wouldn't have been liked by Jesus' disciples, and he wouldn't have been liked by the, by the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They would be like, no, this guy's, he, he's not one of us, because he's a tax collector, which means he kind of like um, legally steals from us. He kind of legally cheats us. He kind of legally oppresses his people. He's like a sellout, okay? And so not to, not to go too deep into the cultural situation there, but tax collectors were not favored because they were Jewish people who were called into public service, and then they, they, they would then have the opportunity to, like, oppress their, their former people group, because now they had political power. 
we'll just leave it at that, but he, he wasn't um, like being invited to many better parties. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. So he's curious. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Small boy. Verse 4. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. If this wasn't in the scripture, you'd be like, why are you reading me a fairy tale right now? <laughs> but, but for some reason, they record this dude climbing in a tree. I love Luke. If you've never read the Gospels, everyone tells you to read John. That's cool. You should, that's a good place to start. But you've got to read Luke. Luke has been blowing me up lately. And I just love the details that Luke, who's a doctor, writes with. And he's like, this guy climbed up, not just in a tree, but in a sycamore tree. Why did he do that? Um, well, he, because he wanted to see him, it says. For he was about to pass that way. Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, um, he looked up, this is Jesus, and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Has anybody ever invited themselves over? <laughs> so some people you might be like, yes, that's awesome. Like maybe it was, you know, like somebody you were wanting to get to know, things like that. But sometimes it's just kind of like, ah, uh, you're in this weird situation, you don't know what to do. It's like, wow, that's really forward of you. <laughs> like, Jesus, okay. But, but remember, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He, he wanted to, to like figure out who this dude was. And so he was, he was pretty amped by it. And, um, you can tell in verse 8, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Like, yeah, come on over. You know, when people didn't know a ton about Jesus, they at least knew he was like a good time. Nobody invited Jesus over to be bored or to be lectured. When people invited Jesus over, it was like, man, you got something I want. I don't know what it's really about, but I want it. You got the better party. I want to, I want to taste that a little bit. And when they saw it, and that's the people around him, specifically like the religious leaders, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. So the crowd was not happy with Jesus' actions. Because when you went into somebody's house and ate with them, that was a much bigger deal than it is today. Today I can eat with whoever I want, and it's like, like I just told you I went to this party, you don't know who those people are, and you're not judging me. Because it's like, who cares? You went over to this place and you ate, no big deal. But back in this day, when you actually shared a meal with somebody, especially in their house, it was like you were saying, I am with them. I'm associating myself with them. I'm choosing to put my name with theirs. And it was a big deal. The religious leaders didn't like that. They thought he, Zacchaeus was like too dirty. They thought he was too far gone, too much for the goodness and grace of our God. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. It's crazy. Zacchaeus, like, he like, does like a fast forward on his step work. He starts making amends. He starts doing his thing. It's like this crazy like transformation that happens to Zacchaeus. He's, he, he goes from being this tax collector to now somebody who's, who's not only going to start living different, but he also wants to make amends to anybody he's hurt. There's something that simply happened in the heart of Zacchaeus where he wants to start living different, even at great expense to himself. There's something that has happened to the heart of Zacchaeus where he wants to start living different even at great expense to himself. I know there's a lot of definitions for a disciple of Jesus, but that fits somewhere. Verse 9, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus is very clear about his mission and his purpose. He was not there to gather a crowd. He was not there to warm ears. He was not there to fill bellies. He was not there to um, just provide physical healing. He was not there to just provide awesome teaching. He was there to seek and to save the lost. It was like the highlight or bright spot of his life. And so as we look at this passage, we actually see a, a great similarity between Zacchaeus and, if you know, another guy named Matthew. 
Zacchaeus and Matthew. Matthew was one of Jesus' um, disciples, but he also was a tax collector. And I, and I looked at that passage, and, and there's a ton of similarities between both Zacchaeus and Matthew. And so I see this rhythm or this pattern of Jesus doing it twice. And so I have to believe that this is something that Jesus would want us to pursue with those who might be far from God. And then we're just going to work through a couple of these things that Jesus does here in this particular passage so that we can begin to say, hey, are these in my life? And how would I begin to change things, maybe even at great expense to myself, so that they could be in my life? The first one is a culture of initiation. A culture of initiation. It seems, and you have uh, an outline with you there, and you can follow along, and there's some place for notes and things like that, and uh, if you you want to. uh, A culture of initiation. Now, the word initiation means that you start something. You, you begin something that maybe wasn't there, or the beginnings of it could have been there, but, but you take a responsibility in beginning something. I remember I had to initiate my first date with my wife, and it was super, it was like before, um, like, uh, uh, websites and, and, like, dating websites and things like that, and it was, it was kind of before that culture, and, and uh, so the way that, that we did it is we, pick, we picked up a phone, and um, I, think I, I think I maybe even had a, uh, like a push button phone at the time. That's how old it was. I don't know if my kids would know what to do with that. But I remember I was somewhere in my living room or whatever, and I called her, and I had never seen her before because it was a blind date my mom was setting me up on. This is a true story. I'm not making it. It's just like Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree. It's me on the phone because mom's like, you should date this girl. And so I'm like, all right, cool. And so I called her, and, and I initiated something that wasn't there before. But... There was actually some forward movement before it happened. There was actually something that was laying the groundwork before I stepped into what I was initiating. So it wasn't completely blind. It wasn't like this total stranger. It was, it, there had been some work between actually her sister who worked with my mom and they were doing their thing and you know, they were like arranging and not, you know, you might call that other stuff, but whatever, they were, they were doing some stuff that we just stepped into and I initiated it to another level. That one worked out really well. <laughs> 21 kids later. Oh, no, not 21 kids. 21 years later. <laughs> Four kids. It feels... No, no. <laughs> Four kids sometimes can feel like 21, but... A culture of initiation. If we're going to uh, begin to become relationally relevant in the lives of people who are far from God, far from understanding Jesus and the gospel message, then, then we're going to have to grow in our culture of initiation. I wrote it out for you on your outline. And it's, it's a pretty simple definition. Becoming um, relationally relevant through spirit-led vision and calling. This, w- this would be um, like a desire to listen more. To listen uh, more. Do you know that Jesus is desirous because he's our shepherd, he's our king, he's our our master. He's desirous to speak to us, and that the shepherd has a voice that's different than other voices. It's an active voice, and it's still active today. And he, he's, listen, he loves talking to you. He loves speaking to you. And there's numerous ways that Jesus can speak to his people. He can speak to them like right now in the midst of this message. He can speak to you through his word. He can speak to you through song. He can speak to you situationally. And for for some people, I don't know a ton of people, for some people it might be audible. For for most, myself included, it's more I hear his voice like with the ears of my heart. And I know when my Jesus is speaking to me. Because I've grown used to trying to listen to his voice. And so as we start thinking about a culture of initiation, we have to first get our minds around, who is Jesus potentially sending me to? What person would function as my Zacchaeus? Who is in the sycamore tree potentially looking for something other or better that has yet to meet Jesus? So it's not just about initiating with anybody and everybody. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I wouldn't stop you from that. But I would say there's a better way. I would say that the the better way that the better host would, would engage in is stopping and asking Jesus, Jesus, who in my life currently have you begun to maybe do a work in? 
maybe there's some brokenness in somebody's life where they're going to be more open to hope and grace. Or maybe there's some curiosity about, like, you know, the church I go to or, or some of the things that they see me read. Or, or maybe we've just been developing a greater relationship where I feel the opportunity is there for me to talk about things that are more important. So this isn't just about go, 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 find some people. This is about let's join what God is already doing and walk into that. But the only way we do that is that we would actually stop and ask God to be clear about who he's potentially calling us to engage, to initiate with. And so before I continue on in in this message, I'm just going to stop. And I'm going to be quiet, and we're going to be quiet, and we're going to ask Jesus to speak to us. And we're going to just ask him a simple question, Jesus, who in my life currently would, would you want me to take a step of initiation towards as it pertains to inviting them to you. Let's just do that. Jesus, now we just want to set aside a few moments and we want to be quiet before you and we want to ask you that you would be very clear to us. You would speak to us, Jesus, as you can. Who that we already know are you potentially doing a work in that you would like us to engage. Jesus, as we quieted our hearts, we ask that you would be clear to us, whether it be somebody we work with or have recreation with or neighbor. Jesus, that it would be your sweet voice inviting us into this bright space, inviting us into this this bright spot in our lives that we might initiate relationship in a meaningful way share your hope with this particular person or people. Amen. Amen. What's the message of initiating with somebody is that God actually sees you and cares about you. That's what that person begins to sense as you initiate with them. A culture of visitation. This is, this is Jesus going in verses 5 through 6 to where Zacchaeus lives. Becoming relationally relevant through entering another person's world and Community. So Jesus, watch this, Jesus doesn't invite the person to where he is. He goes to where Zacchaeus is. He enters Zacchaeus' house, and then he hangs out with Zacchaeus' like, community. So Jesus isn't asking Zacchaeus to come into foreign territory and feel really uncomfortable and, and, and be out of his place. Jesus is willing to leave his place to go to where Zacchaeus is, to, Zacche- to Zacchaeus' context. And so the second principle of uh, becoming the better host would be engaging in a culture of visitation. Entering other people's world. When you do that, the message that you initially send before you spend a word talking about Jesus is that this person is valued. Like your workplace, your life, your family is valuable to me. And I want to let you know that before I let you know anything about the God who values you. That's powerful when you express and demonstrate value for a person's current reality before you expect them to value your current reality. Culture of visitation. Then we have a culture of proximity. We see that um, uh, becoming, this is us becoming relationally relevant um, through nearness. Verse 7. People were upset because Jesus was saying, I'm with Zacchaeus. 
And I'm with the tax collector. I'm putting my reputation on the line to say that we're together. Nearness, proximity. It's very hard to reach somebody with the love and the intimacy and the nearness of God if you are not loving and intimate and near them. Right? That's like a mixed message, is it not? It's like there's a God who sent his son for you to die on the cross because rather than crushing you for your sin, he crushed Jesus in your place. That's how radically in love he is with you, that he would give of himself to call you son, to call you daughter, that he would leave his place at great expense to himself, and he would offer all that he has through Christ on a cross so that you could be forgiven if you would receive and believe this message. That kind of love, that kind of relentless love of a God who loves you exactly where you are, but way too much to leave you there. That kind of message of a God who left his place in order to dwell with us, to then die for us, to then rise again, offering hope, forgiveness, freedom, adoption, cleanliness, a life free from shame, a life free from condemnation for those who would turn from their selfishness and simply receive the free gift of God's grace, a love that is that radical, that comes that close to you and invades your space and invites itself upon your lame reality to give you something far greater, a God of that love who doesn't take no from you, if you're going to start sharing that kind of gospel message with people, but you're going to do it from way up there, it's not going to make sense. It's not going to make sense to talk about a God who wants to know your heart, who gave his son to call you his own from way up there. I mean, you've got to initiate, you've got to visit, and you have to make yourself at great cost to yourself near to people. Because a lot of people need you to know them and love them and hug them and listen to them before they can believe there's a God who would do that. See, this culture of friendship is maybe different than you thought about when, when, when we started talking about evangelism. But proximity is huge. And then finally, a culture of Jesus. The last bit here is, that is a culture of Jesus that we would... Um, become more and more relationally relevant through helping each other to connect Jesus to people's reality. Connecting Jesus to people's reality. This is the message that people begin to get is that God has something better for you than where you are right now. Um, so when we start talking about the culture of Jesus, here's what I mean. I mean that um, when we're sharing the gospel and the, the gospel message is that we as sinners are far from God and that God loved us enough to come and draw us near through Christ. So when we start sharing that message that I just shared with you, um, we have to remember that we're not inviting people like to uh, like a set of beliefs, although there are beliefs with the gospel. We're not inviting people to a church, although there are churches involved in the gospel. We're not inviting people to uh, religion. We're not inviting people to do better or try harder. We're, listen, we're inviting people to a person. And his name is Jesus. So we need to get better at a culture of Jesus where we understand, hey, this is what's going on in your marriage. This is what's going on with your kids. This is what's going on at work. This is what's going on with your finances. This is what's going on in the midst of your addiction. Awesome! I have a Jesus that's perfect for you. He fits right in. He's not afraid. He's not disgusted. I know you're disgusted. I know people around you have been disgusted. He's not. He's the first in and the last to stay. My Jesus has better than where you are. Would you just allow yourself to meet him? As we think about... Uh, Okay, it seems like you're really talking about becoming the better friend. That's, that's true. That's probably the more appropriate title for this message, not just the better host, but reimagining uh, what it might be like to become the, the better friend. What does that look like? Well, it seems like the better friend would do a few things. First, he would, she would learn how to listen. 
The better friend pursues a rhythm of listening. If you're not taking, if you're not with me on this whole thing, that's that's also okay. But you'll probably want to write a few of these words down and, and take them with you. The better friend pursues a rhythm of listening. Uh, I, I told you this before that we serve a God who wants to speak to us. He wants to let us know things. He wants to let us know, hey, initiate with this person. I've already done some work here. Just join me in what I'm doing. And so if we want to be the better friend, if we're reimagining evangelism, we need to reimagine what it might like, what, what it might be like to listen to God. We have people who can help you with that. It's not just my four minutes I spent on it in this message. If, if you ever hear of us announcing Ignite, prayer workshop, go. That's a specific workshop where we spend time learning how to better tune in the ears of our heart and mind to what Jesus wants to tell us in a many different areas. Like I said, maybe it's to this or maybe it's to that. Maybe it's to... But the better fact, if you, want to, if you want to engage in evangelism, we have to engage in listening. Who? Where are you working? God? Like, I, I got to know. Speak to me. And he will. I think we need to become the better friend and, and start to pursue a rhythm of margin. A rhythm of margin. Um, Mitch is our executive pastor, and every week he asks us in the staff connections, he says, who are, um, are you pursuing relationships with people who are non-believers, uh, and, and who are they? What are their names? Like every week, this question is in front of me. And so every week, we as a staff have to come in contact with this question, like, have we created enough margin to not just surround ourselves with more people like ourselves? But have, have we intentionally created and carved out space so that we can become relationally and lovingly relevant to those who want nothing to do with Jesus? That's a matter, it's not just a matter of desire, it's a matter of margin. We as a church, we want to help you with that by not overdoing things and by not always having you scheduled out all week long. We, we're actually changing some things based on this idea that maybe we overscheduled you and now we're going to bring things back so as to give you some more margin to go and initiate and pursue and be with people who are yet to know this God of love. Margin is a decision. It's not just a desire. So if you want to become the better friend, if you want to engage in the heart of Jesus, then you're going to really need to just look practically at your schedule and say, do I have time and margin? to begin to pursue and relate to people who aren't yet here. The final one is the better friend pursues a rhythm of Jesus. We have a help for this. It's called redemption. If you've ever been through our redemption course, it's uh, 10 weeks. And, uh, I know that may sound like a long time, but really what you walk, what you walk into redemption and walk out of redemption with is life changing, I can tell you experience. We've offered different sessions of this, some shorter, some longer. Here's what happens in redemption. You, you learn in a community what it means to see Jesus attached to your heart. Wherever your heart's been wandering, wherever your heart's been, either, either in the past or in the present or even in the future, you learn what does it mean to have the living, resurrected Jesus come in and start to change that area. It's like gospel that matters today. I want to preach a gospel that matters to people today. I need help to do that. I don't always know how to do that and ask the right questions and apply Jesus to people's needs. Well, redemption is a great place for us to get trained in how to do that. If you want more information on that, man, come to the onboarding class. Learn, learn about some of these things that we have to offer. But our question is this. We've asked it every week, or at least tried to. Are you all in? Are you, as the name of the series, are you all in? Are you all in to what God's doing here at the Avenue Church? And, and for you to be all in as it pertains to becoming the better friend, you would have to be able to answer this next question. If I could get that next slide, please. Right here. That's just what we want to leave you with. I mean, it might not be three, it might be one, it might be two, I don't know. But are there three people in your surrounding life right now that you can say, like, these are my three? Like, I own their brokenness. 
Their marriage that's not good, is that's my issue, that's my problem. Their situation with their sick child, that's, that's my situation. I, I've become so um, available and relevant to this particular person that, that they're, they're mine. They don't know Jesus yet, but they know the love of Jesus through me. Like I have said that these are my three. I, I can't be this for everyone, every place, at every time. But the Lord has led me to these two or to these three individuals. And I'm pursuing them, I'm pursuing their families, and I'm making myself open and relevant because I believe God wants to do a work of inviting them to the better party. Man, if you all walked away from here and were able to begin to answer, hey, these are my three, these are my three, these are my three. That could be like 600 people who maybe are yet to know the love of Christ that begin to sense and are eventually invited by the power of the Holy Spirit to the better party. That would begin the radical gospel renewal that we've been talking about. But it will start with you answering that question. God, we're going to sing. As we sing, Lord, we just... Um, we want to dedicate this time to you. Lord, we know that if... if we pursue others without pursuing you. We won't have anything to give them. So we're about to say your name, Jesus, over and over and over again in a worshipful way. And I pray that as we have this posture of worship, that you would even be speaking to us in these moments of how you want to be applied to our hearts currently and who you want us to share that with. Jesus, help us as we ourselves are in need of the better body. Amen. Amen. We'll have our prayer partners down here in mind. Has Jesus ever made the darkness tremble for you? Has Jesus ever silenced your fear? Has Jesus ever brought healing where you thought there could never be healing? Has Jesus ever brought you to a place where you had heart for people that you never thought you would have. Well, then you got to share that. you got to invite other people to that Jesus because he wants to do the same for them. We're going to leave the team here and we're going to play a little bit longer. I'm going to dismiss us with a benediction, but I'm just wondering if maybe in the midst of talking about going to people, there's people here among us who need to come to that party for themselves. Hey, we just want to invite you to come and share that with somebody down here. And they'll pray over you and they'll, they'll invite you to that party. and They'll connect Jesus to your heart for the first time through the power of the Holy Spirit. They'll help, help you to do that if that's something you've never done before. We want to make sure that we make that invite available to you today. I'm going to ask a benediction, which is a, it's like a promise over God's people. And um, it's going to be in this vein. Now, being the God who has his heart lit up, when the newcomer is brought to the party, may that God light your heart up like never before for the love he has for you and the love he wants to share through you. If you receive that, say amen. 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 Love you guys. See you next week.